Hello, my name is Katja Hoyer. I'm a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, and I'm interested in understanding the developmental and evolutionary sources of brain organization. Today, I would like to talk to you about mechanical morphogenesis and the development and evolution of primate cortical folding. In my presentation, I will focus on the emergence of folding patterns across different primate species in the light of mechanical morphogenesis and phylogeny. The folding of the neocortex is a distinctive feature of large mammalian brains, and folding patterns are strongly conserved between individuals of one species and characteristic for each species. And the geometry corresponds in many cases with the cytoarchitectonic, connective, and functional organization of the brain. So as we can see here, for example, the primary motor cortex and somatosensory cortex to either sides of the central sulcus across the maps for human, macaque, lemur, and marmoset. And when we look across many species of the mammalian kingdom, like here, for example, in this beautiful illustration by Leah Kubitzer, we see that the size and the location of the primary cord or of the cortical fields varies largely between species. And we can also see that the size does not increase as the cortex grows, but um, that more and more associative cortices are being added. And if we look across many different species, um, the geometric and organizational complexity vary together. So the larger the brain, the more folded the brain will be, and also the more cortical areas we will have. Now, how does the species characteristic folding patterns emerge? To what extent does mechanical morphogenesis influence the evolution of the neocortex? During the last few years, the idea that brain folding is produced by a mechanical instability triggered by neocortical expansion has been more and more uh, recognized. However, folding patterns are still believed to be genetically encoded. And we would like to ask to what extent mechanical morphogenesis influences the organization, development, and evolution of the neocortex of the primates. A few years ago, uh, Roberto Toro started the Brain Catalog Project to study the evolution of neuroanatomical diversity across the vertebrate kingdom, together with the Natural History Museum in Paris and the Institute of Brain and Spinal Cord. Um, and we, in this collection of the museum, there are many uh, different brains of many different primates. And so we were able to study high resolution MRI images of 34 different primate species. And we use different tools to uh, segment the PL surface and also our collaborative web app Brainbox, and we were able to reconstruct the, the 3D surfaces for all these different species. And in the first analysis, we looked at the volume of the brain, the surface area, and the global gyrification, and we also developed a method to study average for depth and width. And um, then we used phylogenetic trees built from genetic data and fitted different evolutionary models. And this is, for example, the simulation of a Brownian motion model, where the phenotypes are uh, assumed to vary randomly along the phylogenetic tree. And in the next simulation, we see the Ornstein Ulmbeck model, where the phenotype is also assumed to vary randomly along the phylogenetic tree, but striving towards an advantageous adaptive value. And uh, we also tested the early burst model. And among these three that we tested, the Brownian motion model fit the best to our data. And um, what we observed is that brain volume in several branches of the, of the phylogenetic tree only decreased and decreased. For example, the branch leading to the Lemuridae and the Galago. In other branches, like for example, the one leading to the human, brain volume only increased and increased. And then there is branches where there is a mix of decreases and increases of brain volume, for example, in the branch leading to the Tufte Capuchin. And um, these phylogenetic models also allow us to estimate the ancestral traits um, along the phylogenetic tree. And the brain of the common ancestor of all primates about 74 million years ago has been estimated to have a, a brain size and degree of folding comparable to the brain of an eye. eye. Um, and interestingly, we also observed a strong conservation of the fold width, uh, which is very close to one centimeter across all these different primate species, um, starting from the vervet monkey uh, all the way to the humans. So despite a 24, uh, more than 20 fold difference in volume, we observe a very uh, conserved brain folding width. And um, so to, to conclude, uh, this analysis has shown that there is an interesting nonlinear relationship between volume and wavelength, and also that random changes may be an important force for primate brain evolution. 
Um, now, how do these folding patterns emerge? Do they result from specific genetic programs? If folding patterns resulted from genetic programs, we should expect that primates that are closer in the phylogenetic tree would have a folding pattern that would be more similar than compared to uh, primates that are in farther apart branches of the phylogenetic tree. And here I highlighted a few that we will look at uh, particularly. Um, and you see at the different colors already that they come from different branches of the phylogenetic tree. Um, for example, the crab eating macaque and toothed cabochin. Uh, we developed a method that allows us to encode folding patterns as a graph. So we start from the 3D surface reconstruction, we remove all the super regions, and then we are able to shrink this uh, gyro gruyere into a wireframe, which we can then represent as a graph, an adjacency matrix where the edges are the gyri and the nodes are where the gyri fuse, and the holes are the salicy, which we annotated here a few of them, so for better orientation. And this is, for example, the fold graph of the toothed cappuccine. And here you can see for, for different species of our collection, uh, the fold graphs um, and, and appreciate the um, display of their, their complexity. And um, we use the graph at a distance algorithm to measure how similar these graphs are. So the graph at a distance algorithm allows us to um, estimate the number of edits we would need to derive one graph into another graph. And here we did that for the example of the toothed cabochin and crab eating macaque, for example. Um, if you look at the phylogenetic tree, you would expect that they wouldn't have a, a similar folding pattern, more similar than the duopoli, for example, which is very close in the phylogenetic tree, where you would expect a similar folding pattern. And for the crab eating macaque, the common ancestor has been 47 million years ago. And what we actually see with the graph at a distance um, measurement is that to derive a crab eating macaque into a toothed cappuccin, only a very few edits are needed. However, if you want to transform a cappuccin into a durukuli, uh, which are phylogenetically closer, the folding uh, pattern is more, much more different. And um, so that's very interesting because the toothed cappuccin is a particularly interesting example. Its ancestor may likely have had an unfolded lysencephalic small brain about 47 million years ago, but then the toothed cappuccin derived a larger brain and ended up very close in terms of brain volume to the crab eating macaque. And um, we can see that this is not just an outlier. We see it across many different species. So here, for example, King Kolobus, white-faced sapaju, gray cheek mangabe, and many of them have a common ancestor 47 million years ago, um, likely this encephalic and small brain. And um, here, 20, uh, more than 20 million years ago, the common ancestor. Uh, and, and yet, um, just based on a more similar brain volume, these species have derived a very similar folding pattern. So these analyses suggest that mechanical factors may play an important role in the evolution of brain organization, and that folding patterns are more similar given a brain volume similarity rather than the position in the phylogenetic tree. Um, so if folding patterns were genetically encoded, Toothed cappuccines should have evolved uh, in parallel a similar folding pattern to the crab eating macaque. It's more likely, however, that uh, folding patterns, same as degree of folding, are uh, constrained by mechanical morphogenetic forces. And, um, and uh, it has been shown that the initial geometry of the unfolded cortex may be a strong determinant of the orientation of the folding. In addition to the initial geometry, uh, our global shape, uh, also global expansion gradients uh, should influence mechanical morphogenetic processes, which then lead to the formation of stable folding patterns. And we recently studied these expansion gradients using a nonlinear surface deformation algorithm to create homologies between all species. And this resu uh, resulting evolutionary expansion trajectory going from the small lemurs toward the great apes illustrates a striking continuity such that folding patterns were similar along species uh, with comparable brain volume, despite their position in the phylogenetic tree, underlining again um, the importance of mechanical morphogenetic processes in the definition of folding patterns. And to better understand this evolutionary trajectory, we fit the surface-based Gompertz model, which allowed us to map differences in expansion rate and expansion uh, onset. And uh, we see that the evolutionary trajectory we obtained uh, showed a caudal rustral gradient. 
um, where the more caudal regions start expanding earlier and faster than the more rostral ones, which start to expand later and, and um, take longer. So to conclude, given uh, a neocortical thickness is very stable across primates, mechanical morphogenetic processes should lead to the formation of folds of similar wavelength organized in a pattern influenced by global shape and global expansion gradients. And within this framework, brain folds would act as mechanically canalized, strongly polygenic modules with uh, stereotypical shape and large scale gradients of mechanical stress, which could then influence cell proliferation, cell fate, and connectivity during development and evolution. And with that, I would like to thank all the people that I have the pleasure to work with, and especially Roberto Tour uh, in Paris, who is working with me in all these projects, and Nicolas Tour, who joined our team as well. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to our discussion.